You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is What the Heck with Mike Heck on MMAFighting.com. Now, here is your host, Mike Heck. What the heck? Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of What the Heck here on MMAFighting.com. Thank you all for checking out the program this week. So much going on, as always, in this crazy sport of ours. UFC Vegas 16 is in the books. It was a great night for Marvin Vittori. Picked up the biggest win of his career against Jack Hermanson in the main event. We're actually going to talk to one of the big stars from that event to kick off the show in just a few minutes. We saw Yoel Romero get released from the UFC. We saw Anthony Johnson part ways with the UFC. But his return to MMA will go down in Bellator MMA. What a great move that was. I think adding Romero would be, I mean, it was a no-brainer anyways. It is definitely a no-brainer now, but we'll see. I know there's reports out there that Bellator is not interested. We've seen Scott Coker say, I might have said we're not interested, but doesn't mean we're not going to be interested like later. I don't know. It's kind of weird, but something tells me the interest will peak at some point because I, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand. Yoel Romero is one of the top five middleweights in the world, maybe top three. Jed Mashud thinks he's top two if you watch Between the Links, but we'll see. We talked all about Romero on Between the Links. If you guys haven't checked that out, so head back, watch that. You'll get everybody's take on the release of Yoel Romero. That was a shocker on Friday. We have UFC 256 going down this weekend in Las Vegas. Davison Figueiredo versus Brandon Moreno for the UFC Flyweight title is the main event. Love that fight. However, as expected, especially three week turnaround for both champion and challenger. There is a contingency plan in place as I reported on Friday night. Manel Cape, the former Ryzen Bantamweight champion has still not made his UFC debut yet. They have tried many, many times. It just hasn't worked out. Manel Cape is serving as the backup fighter in case something does go awry, which by all accounts seems very unlikely at this point. Figueiredo saying he's already in the low 130s, could make weight anytime. Moreno has Never really had issues on the scale, as far as I know. That's a really interesting fight. Fighter of the year could could actually be on the line in that fight, if you think about it. I mean, if Figueiredo wins, it's a no-brainer. Brandon Moreno wins, he has inserted himself into that conversation, no doubt about it. Tony Ferguson, he is back against Charles Oliveira. Huge fight right there at 155. The card is pretty damn good. It is pretty damn good. I've had uh, chats with Brandon Moreno, as well as Kevin Holland, who fights Jacare Souza on the main card on Saturday. You can find those interviews on last week's show, or you can just go find them in the archives individually. Uh, as there's two more events left for the UFC this year. Bellator is their last event tonight, headlined, not their last event ever, but last event of 2020, headlined by Alima Leigh McFarlane defending her flyweight title against Juliana Velasquez, who has been, in my mind, the number one contender for like three years now. She finally gets her title shot. That's a really interesting fight. That's one of the more interesting fights of the entire week. But uh, so make sure you check that out. I'm fascinated to see how that plays out. If Alima Leigh McFarlane wins that fight, it's kind of a now what scenario. Like what's next? Like what else can be done? Do you run it back with Alejandra Lara? I mean, what do you do? Velasquez seemed to be kind of like the last domino to fall. So we'll see. But Velasquez is a, is a very tough out. Well, let's run down the lineup for this show and we'll get to our first guest. Wrapping us up this week, we're going to chat with Walt Harris, the big ticket himself. And to sort of peel back the curtain, Walt Harris was originally scheduled to be on What the Heck last week. We released the show. He came on the day, like the day we released it. So like five or six hours after the show was released because as we're getting ready to sit down and have our interview the day before it was supposed to be released, USADA came and knocked on the door. So we got delayed a day. So I spoke with Walt this past Thursday. So it was like a week ago because he had been part of the broadcast team for the UFC Vegas 15 event. So we talked all about that when he's hoping to return and, you know, we touched on just the really tough year he has had in and out of the octagon, just really good on his stuff. And then we had some fun at the end talking some NBA. So if you're a basketball fan, Walt is a huge NBA fan, knows his stuff. We'll speak with Walt Harris to wrap up the show this week. Tyson Chartier is going to be back on the show. The manager, the coach for the likes of, I don't know, guys you might have heard of, Calvin Cater, Rob Font. In fact, 
Tyson Chartier was my first interview when I moved over to MMA fighting. It was right when the pandemic hit and we thought UFC 249 was gonna be at Tachi Palace. Remember that whole thing? That was, it seemed like forever ago. And then Calvin Cater was supposed to fight Jeremy Stevens. That event got canceled or postponed a couple of weeks. Then he still fought Jeremy Stevens. And then this, this whole year has just been nuts. It, that, that, it just seems like a decade ago now, does it not? But he's back. It's been a crazy year for him, as well as the entire New England cartel. Rob Font's got a big one next weekend against Marlon Marias. First fight of 2020, recovering from an ACL injury and surgery. Calvin Cater fighting Max freaking Holloway on January 16th. Excited to catch up with Tyson. He feels like he needed some redemption from the last time he was on the show. He'll explain why a little bit later on. Alex Morano's had an interesting year. It began with losing his opponent, Diego Lima, right before UFC 247 to an injury and in stepped Chaos Williams on around a week's notice. And Alex Morano got finished in 27 seconds. Then he comes back a few months later, fights and beats Reese McKee in an empty arena. And now he's fighting Anthony Pettis on December 19th, huge fight. For the great white, we will speak with him about the biggest bout of his career in around 20 minutes or so. But first, let us talk with one of the big stars from this past Saturday night's UFC Vegas 16 event. He slammed his way into his first octagon win, his first performance bonus. Heck, slammed his way into, uh, into hearts around the world. How about that? Let us say hello once again to Jordan Levitt. All right, let us say hello once again to one of the big stars of this past Saturday's UFC Vegas 16 event. He makes his UFC debut, and 22 seconds later, it was over, following a vicious slam knockout of Matt Wyman. Jordan Levitt back on the program. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Congratulations, by the way. And I were, it's funny, there are times where I watch fights happen and. I remember having conversations with with the fighters in the cage, you being one of them watching this fight happen. I remember the first time I actually interviewed you, it's probably like a year and a half ago, and you were this guy that had this great personality, you were a little outside of the box, and you were having such a hard time just finding somebody to fight you. Like you were calling out everybody around the country you were getting maybe a fight a year. Fast forward to now, you fought five times since then, got on the Contender Series, got a contract with the UFC, and now you get your first UFC win. This thing moved along pretty quickly, did it not? Oh, yeah, 100%. I went from averaging a fight a year to having five fights in the calendar year, four fights in 2020, even when the four of the months were completely canceled. Baby on the way, bought a dog. Like, 2020 has been the best year of my life so far. Um like yeah i went from having no luck to all the luck it's crazy man and one one other thing that really stuck out about that conversation is besides you calling out every 55er in the sport was when i asked you what your goal was in fighting at the time it wasn't like going to the ufc or going this way or being a world champion you very nonchalantly said and i'm somewhat paraphrasing here you know what? I just want to get a knockout. Like I've got a bunch of submissions. I just want to know what it feels like to get a knockout. And while this may not have been the knockout you envisioned, or you know, maybe it was, how does it feel a few days later now that you've accomplished that and you did it in the UFC of all places? Right? I mean, it took until my my 12th fight to get a knockout, and it was on the biggest stage on a main card in the UFC. I didn't see it coming that way, especially like via Rampage Slam. Um, yeah, de definitely don't train for that one. So that was cool. I'll be honest. When I heard you were fighting Matt Wyman, I didn't know what to think about it because Matt was a guy like a lot of people had their eye on at 155 before he took that like several year hiatus away from the sport. But since he came back, he got beat up pretty bad by Luis Pena, then Joe Selecki. What did you think of the matchup when it was presented to you? When you saw Matt Wyman's name on the contract, what did you think? Um, it was really weird because I used to be a really big fan of him when I was younger. Um, I feel like a lot of the tactics he used were like 10 years ahead of the time. He would drop him for leg locks. He would pull guard. He would do single leg scrambles. Like He did a lot of stuff that I really like thought was interesting that I still implement today. So when I saw his name, I was like, oh, that's weird. Like One of my favorites. So I had mixed feelings coming into this fight. I'm like, I didn't want, I was like saying, like, I don't want to get knocked out by, by Matt Wyman, but I don't want to knock Matt Wyman out. And I was like, he's never been submitted before. So I was planning on him being rugged and me having to like ride out a decision. 
So the fight was pretty anticlimactic. Um, I, you know, I got pretty lucky and fortunate with that slam, and it was a kind of a scary knockout. And yeah, I hope I never have the win by that way again. But if it's the opportunity presents itself, I will slam you. But yeah, it's, it's weird, man. <laughs> That's crazy. And, uh, you know, like, like you said, you brought up an interesting point. Like you, you went for the takedown immediately and your corner basically said, like, bring him over here. You did that. And then I said, where are you? Like, <laughs> what's, 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 like bring him over here. And then, like, you know, the lights are on you. So there's like that, that stage blindness. And I'm like, where are you? And then I think Matt began to chuckle. I think he began to chuckle. And then I kind of cut it off. But like, I was like, where are you? And then dumped him. Wood said that was the most Jordan-esque knockout it could have ever been. Um, he's like, it went from playful to scary real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it, it was funny because you could actually see that moment. I didn't even hear you say, where are you? But you could see the moment. You're like, oh, yeah, I see you. Like, your eyes opened up a little wider. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious now that you say that. But he was, as as you're looking for this takedown, he's trying to, like, maintain balance, it looked like. But then he wrapped his legs around you as if he wanted to pull guard and, you know, you adjust your forearm and that was a wrap. Were you surprised that was, like his defense before the slam was to attempt to pull guard? Like I would imagine going to the ground, even though he's very difficult to submit, would be like the last thing he'd want to do against you. Kind of walk us through that moment and what you were feeling at the time. So I shot in on his hips and I could have finished the takedown right there. But I didn't want I didn't want him to fall to his guard because he kind of just holds you down and he'll saw you out in his guard. And I didn't want to be elbowed on the top of the head for an entire round. So he went to pull initially, but I picked him up to stop him from pulling guard. And so when I picked him up, he tried to, you know, finally start to sprawl. By that time, my hands were locked and he couldn't get his feet to the ground. Like I was able to get like a nice little Matt Hughes type of lift. And then I think he kind of just like conceded, okay, I'll just fall to my, I'll lock in my guards, then that way. I could, you know, control where the fight goes. But as soon as he locked it, I locked in that Gerald Harris, like, cross face and just, you know, dumb. They hit him with the earth. I do, uh, I do want to address one thing that some folks, I guess, have had an issue with with this whole thing. It was the celebration afterwards. And first off, let me just say my piece here first. Kudos to you for having the wherewithal to know Matt was done after the slam. And also leaving the cage to console Matt's wife in the corner outside of it. I, I thought that was amazing. Some people had an issue with the splits and the celebration afterwards because Matt was out like a light. He was out cold. Personally, I didn't have much of an issue with it, Jordan, because like other, you know, like, like others, because I've been talking to you for a while. I've been following your career for a while. That's what you do when you win. This is nothing new. This wasn't a, oh yeah, I just got a knock out. Let me do a split. You do this pretty much every time you win. I'm also taking into account that I'm not a fighter. I have no idea what goes on in that cage other than what I see on television. But for those who may have had an issue with the celebration, is that something you want to address at all? I mean, sure. I mean, these are the same people that loved it when Jorge Masvidal bodied Ben Askren, then patted the ground. These are the same people that love it when there's just blood everywhere. So, I mean, screw them. Their opinion doesn't mean much. They're very fickle. Um... I'm sure if I would have gotten knocked out, he would have jumped on the cage. He would have screamed at the camera. But, you know, you fall into a quick split, and then you walk to the cage realizing he's not waking up right away. And then they go to commercial break because you're crying. And it's like, oh, you're the bad, you're the bad guy. And I'm like, this is an ugly sport. And I was upset by the way I won. But literally, there are many more brutal knockouts of that all the time, and these people cheer for it. So it's like, your booze mean nothing. I've seen what makes you cheer kind of thing um yeah it was a hard it was hard for me and not as hard for me as it was for matt or his wife but um i waited for him to wake up and then i did the dirty dancing lift and then the reason i did it twice is because bruce buffer's like come on i missed it you have to do it and when bruce buffer asks you something i'm like okay bruce i've wanted to talk to you since i've been 14 okay this lifts for you but um i can understand by the way it was cut it could seem tasteless but in reality, if you've been watching this sport for longer than 24 hours, you see some pretty distasteful things. So yeah, it's a little, I mean, I'm sorry if I offended people, but then also grow up. It's fighting. Yeah, it's fighting. Like a fist fight's, co fish fight's totally fine. Cutting them open, knocking them out, breaking their legs, fine. You can't do a, a laughable dance afterwards. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't even like it was just I think it was just this just the split and maybe like some people like didn't realize that 
you went there there was a commercial break and then the dirty dancing thing happens so like maybe some people realize like didn't realize that that happened like after matt woke up and and all that stuff which is awesome by the way what how did bruce react once he saw it the second time what did he say to you he said oh ballet's your base huh and i'm like it's the best base for party <laughs> plus plus on top of that like after that time you had to have known that an extra 50 g's there's a good chance that was coming your way too right like you're about to become a dad that's kind of a game changer is it not yeah we just we just we've been looking at apartments the past few days and i'm i basically just plan on buying getting the lease paying out the lease for an entire year um i've never had that stability ever in my life i've never been able to enjoy knowing that for a year me and my family would be okay and yeah, that 50, 50 G's is really a game changer to life changer. Um, I get to bring my daughter into the world when I don't have to worry about paying the bills. I don't, I may be able to, may even be able to spend like a, a few weeks just with my family and anything's worth that. I, I do anything for that. So definitely a game changer. May I ask what you, what you said to Matt's wife on the outside? There's not, I didn't know, I didn't know exactly what to say. I just, I just said, I'm sorry, you know, and I just, because I was sorry. I just said like, I mean, I'm sorry that I won that way. And then she was very, very composed and she's just said, it's the fight game. It happens. And which kind of made me feel worse. I'm like, she's cool with it, but I'm not cool with it. Um, but yeah, I just said, I'm sorry. And then I said, your husband's a good man. And then, you know, I'm not sure if she reached out to hug me or I reached out to hug her. I don't know. If I reached out to hug her, I guess that was kind of weird. But, um, but yeah, then I went back in the cage. But, yeah, I just said, I'm sorry. I don't think, I'm not sure. I wasn't quite sure what you should say. Yeah. Did you, did you have a chance to, to talk to Matt at all? I know he was kind of out of it, but did you guys get to exchange words at all before you left the cage? Um. We weren't able to talk, but I got a message for him, and I got a and then I got a message back to him. But that's about all. Um, I just, you know, thanked him for his career, and we just, you know, he gave a quick little message back. I don't think there's any bad blood there. He's never been that type of person. Um, we're both religious people. We're both very soft spoken, and I don't imagine there's any bad blood. And I hope there's not. And yeah, that's all you could hope for. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think there would be bad blood there, but maybe you know. Um, you mentioned, that, I mean, this is a crazy year. You're, you've taken advantage of it in a big way. You have an Octagon debut that lasts 22 seconds. You took absolutely zero damage. There's there's a lot of folks. I mean, you, I see that. Where did that happen? Gave my, I hit my forearm, hit myself in the, I hit myself in the face. <laughs> <in my yourself. laughs> you know, I'm a dangerous person. I'm hurting people and I'm hurting myself. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if that was like from training or something. I don't know, but uh, there's, a, <laughs> that's hilarious. There's a, there's a lot of folks who would say like in your position, I'm ready. I'll fight this week, next week. Just get me on a card. You and your wife are about to welcome your first child into the world in February. And you basically said after the fight, like I'm spent, I want to spend this final trimester with my wife. I'll worry about fighting after that. First of all, as a dad myself, completely respect that hundred percent. Is there anything that would get you to fight before that? Um, I suppose if like something on the 19th card was perfect for me and then i jump on last minute you know the only thing better than 50k to support your family is 100k so i mean it's worth the risk but um yeah that's that's the only card that i feasibly see a chance of me hopping on to um but that seems very that seems mostly unlikely but it's also 2020 so we'll see but um no i am i'm i'm gonna be a help me for my wife the last trimester um she's been a trooper this entire time making my meals as she like couldn't even like keep down solid food and making sure that I'm okay. Like I, my fight career could take a hold for two and a half months. So March, April, something in that time frame you're oh, thinking yeah. about? It's, you know, two weeks after that baby's here, I'm, I'm down to go into quarantine again. We could, just, we could, I, I, I'm excited to fight again. I want to see what fights are open at that time. And I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see who will sign on. We'll see who will sign on the dotted line. Is there anybody that kind of sticks out to you? I mean, why? I mean, it's interesting that you fight Matt Wyman, a guy that when you were growing up, he's a guy that you watch and kind of took some of your game away from and kind of used it as your own. Is there 
anybody else on the roster that you're just like, not, 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 there's no bad blood here, obviously, unless there is, but just like, man, I, I want to fight this guy. Like I've, I've been a fan of his or, or something like that. Is there anybody that kind of makes sense for you right now in terms of a next opponent? No, I, I, no one really comes to mind. And I know that's very generic. I'll fight anybody. Um, I can't think of like, I've only been in this division for like six months. I, I, I was always looking at the 45 division and be like, oh, I'd like to fight that person when I get in. Like, I'm still just a fanboy of the 55 division. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see who has bad blood for me because I'll, I don't need bad blood to fight anybody. It's just a fist fight fan. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully someone will call me out. I don't have to be weird about that. I would love for someone to just call me out. But okay, cool. That's a fight, Sean Shelby. Let's do it. <laughs> you know that's coming, right? I'm hoping they want to <laughs> knock out Split Boy. They're going to put Baby in a corner. Uh, we'll see what Dan he does when we'll see what Dan he does when I put him to sleep. I'm wait, I'm. I mean, I'm ready for the very generic call outs. I mean, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last time we talked. It was right before the Contender Series fight, and I asked you what that contract would mean to you, and you said, you know, you mentioned how how much you want to support your family, but. It was a really powerful thing that you said that that I've remembered ever since. You said, I just want to be less embarrassed when I tell people I'm a fighter. Mission accomplished? Yeah, mission accomplished. How does that feel? Um, a little weird. Uh, there's a lot of people that doubt you when you do things that are different and risky. And... People you love and people you people you love who are worried about you and people you hate who just will talk down to anything you do. Got a lot of negative feedback this entire time, and I don't hear them now. Um, they're just like echoes that are just fading more and more in the distance because they were wrong. I got to prove them wrong. And it's nice to, you know, I can't wait to see them. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, congrats, man. I'm really happy for you. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, man. Um, I'm happy to not be embarrassed anymore. It's happy to know that I wasn't um, deluded or silly or just, you know, someone who was just chasing a dream for with no real basis to be chasing it. It's, it's a nice place to be in. Last thing before I let you go, I, I, I know – I know you're not a fan of like the knockout memes that have been going around. I'm sure that probably bothers you, but there are some brilliant ones with the dirty dancing lift. Um, they, they did after the decision, the, the Swayze one doing the hoisting. I mean that seeing things like that and fans taking time to like make stuff like that and, and put you in there. That's gotta be pretty cool to see. Right. Oh, oh, that's a dream come true, man. I've always wanted to be a meme. I grew up as like a part of the meme generation. That's how, um, that's how we send jokes. That's how we post our political views. That's how we put people down. Becoming a meme is like immortality to my generation. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Um, oh yeah, I love I love the dirty dancing memes. I I love the split memes. Yeah, I don't like the videos of the slam. It kind of makes me cringe. I've only watched my fight once. It made you know it makes me uncomfortable. But oh yeah, the. The memes and the comments on Reddit and stuff, the funny jokes. Oh, I live for it. It's a, it's a dream come true. <laughs> Good stuff right there from Jordan Levitt. Definitely got to pay attention to. We didn't even talk about the books. Like I talked to him. If you go back into the archives, you could watch the conversation I had with Jordan before the Contender Series fight. He likes, he, his goal is to read like 100 books a year. So he's reading like two, three books a week. It's just crazy. It's, it's just unbelievable. Just a really smart guy. And as I said on, on to the next one, the matchmaking podcast, if you haven't seen that, I hope they kind of like slow roll him a little bit. Like there's no need to rush Jordan Levitt, especially at 55. Let him build himself up. I think he could become a very popular fighter. I think he could be a very dangerous guy throughout his entire career at 155. If they can promote him correctly, and just let him do his thing. Like, no need to throw him into a top 25 fight right now. There's just, there's just no need to do that. Just continue to build him up slowly, showcase him, let him build his way up, let him let his confidence continue to rise, and they could do good things with him. I mean, when was, it's, when was the last time they've brought in somebody, just completely molded them from the beginning, 
and had him work his way up. Like, there's no need to rush this guy is all, is all I'm really trying to say. He's ready for December 19th if if, if they call him up, if somebody needs a, a quick replacement. I don't think they're going to bring in another new fight for him because there's already, I think, like 278 fights on that card for <laughs> December 19th. We're going to be watching fights for 14 hours, and I'm not complaining about that. I'm not being cynical as some folks out there have said in the comments. I'm not a cynical guy at all. But I'm just telling you like it is. Go look at the car. There's a million fights on there. But uh, we'll see what happens with Jordan Levin. I'm excited to see what is next for him at the end of the day. As we move ahead to our next guest, huge opportunity ahead of himself next Saturday against Anthony Pettis on that December 19th car we just spoke of. Alex Morano makes his What the Heck debut. All right, let's check in with Alex Morano, who's going to fight Anthony Pettis next weekend in Las Vegas. UFC Vegas 17, I believe we're calling this event. These names are all over the place, but uh, final <laughs> event of the year. Pretty cool way to cap off the year. Alex, good to see you, man. How are you? Cool, man. I'm doing awesome. Uh, you know, kind of in like a, a fireball two-week fight camp. It's been a lot of fun. You know, anytime coming to fight camp in good shape always makes things easy. And it was funny, you know, after my fight, uh, you know, mid-November, I was kind of perusing all the different fight cards. And I had a few teammates on this on this card. And I was like, man, it would be crazy to get on that card. But I was like, but there's no way. You know, I just fought. And dude, sure enough, man, they offer they offer me Pettis on the last the last card of the year. Arguably one of the best fight cards of the year. Very excited. It's a big opportunity, and I'm looking to uh, to make the most out of it. So when did you actually know that this is a thing? Like, how long ago? Uh, last Tuesday. So one week from yesterday, and I'm, like, in the middle of teaching a big kid's jiu-jitsu class. And uh, in the middle of class, you know, I, my phone's blown up. And, and, you know, naturally, I'm teaching. I don't, I don't go get on my phone. But uh, but the, uh, the program director at my gym, our front desk lady, had, like, walked on the mats, which is unorthodox, and hands me the gym phone line. And I'm like, all right, what's up? And she's like, hey, it's your coach in Dallas. And like, anytime Coach Safe calls me, I like instantly like get in line and I'm like, all right. And I take the phone call and coach is like, hey, Morano, you know, they offered Anthony Pettis on the 19th. And I was like, coach, can I call you back after class? And he's like, no. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll take the fight. And then, you know, so I immediately, you know, I like tell my striking coaches at the gym with me, he's teaching you know, a kickboxing class. I'm like, hey, you know, you'll never guess what they just offered. And I'm like, but, you know, I don't know if Pettis is going to accept. I don't know if the UFC is like actually going to book it. I just, there's a bunch of unknowns. And like, I'm talking less than 20 minutes later before the class is even over. I, uh, my phone just starts blowing up and they, and ASPN, Brett, Brett Okamoto had posted the fight was a, a, was a go. And I was like, how did they find out? I literally just said yes, like minutes ago. So, I mean, it was on, you know, I had, I had less than 20 minutes to kind of like be in that surreal state of mind. And then like, as soon as it was announced, I was like, awesome. I get to do some damage to Pettis. It's time to rock and roll. That's amazing, man. This, this whole year has been interesting for you, hasn't it? Like you started off UFC 247 against Chaos Williams, last minute opponent switch. Didn't go your way, but then you bounced back. You had that nice win in November against Reese McKee, and now you're fighting a former world champion to cap things off. If someone told you in or February was when that fight happened, excuse me. If someone told you in February after the Chaos Williams fight that you'd be fighting Anthony Pettis at the end of the year, that would be stricken by a pandemic that you probably didn't even know much about at the time. <laughs> what would you have said to them? You know, my coach said the same thing. He was like, Morano, imagine if I told you to be fighting Pettis, you know, after your loss in February. I was like, there's no way I would never have believed you. And like beyond uh, losing the chaos fight in my hometown in front of everyone, in front of everybody, you know, the lockdown happens. I almost go out of business. Uh, man, I had a, my, my middle brother had passed away. Um, I had a, I was on a hunting trip and a friend got shot. This year was bad. Like this. Uh, and then like I was telling my striking coaches, like, dude, this year can't get any worse. And like the next day as he's leaving the gym, a guy runs a red light and hits him. He was fine. But like we stopped saying things couldn't get worse because things kept getting worse. And then thankfully, you know, business kind of picks back up in October and November. I get the fight. I win the fight, you know, and then uh, and then I get this this fight offer in December. I got a really cool you know, opportunity for my, my gym and my team coming at the end of the year as well. The year, thankfully, has really turned around. And I'm like captain positive energy. Like, you know, I try to be optimistic no matter what happens. And this year was really testing that. But thankfully, it's it's finished pretty strong. Has this been like the most trying year for you? I mean, it has the opportunity to end in a really strong way. But in terms of just trying to balance out the positive and the negatives and, and try to get over that hump and, and stay positive like you normally are, has this been one of those years where it's been more difficult than any other? I mean, yeah, you know, and, and I've been very grateful and thankful that like my life has had the the route that it's taken. I haven't had many bad years. I mean, I can't really think of anything. And then really from like 2015 on, 
has just been like so many cool, like, you know, like got to the UFC, you know, like full owner of my gym, you know, bought a house, p- paid the house off. Like everything has just been kind of, you know, going up and up. And uh, yeah, I guess 2017, I think I, is when I fought Nico Price and then I fought Keita Nakamura. So I had no contest and a, and a loss that year. So that, I mean, uh, like competition wise, that was no fun, but the year itself was a good year. And uh, yeah, so this has certainly b- been a, uh, a growing year for sure. And not only for myself, like the, the entire planet, not even the U.S., but, you know, it's been it's been tough for everyone. So any bit of good news or opportunistic moments that I can find this year, I'm really trying to cling on to and make the most out of them. And, uh, and, and finishing this year as such is, is a really good way to kind of counteract all the negativity. So it's been it's been awesome. Well, I'm happy you've been able to find some silver linings. I'm sorry about all the things that have happened to you this year. Um, I did want to touch on one of the things that you that that did happen this year, the chaos fight, because, you know, as everybody knows or should know, you were supposed to fight Diego Lima switch happens on like a week's notice. Didn't go your way. Chaos is, you know, kind of taken off at this point. What did you take away from that, from that night in, in Houston, Texas? Yeah. Again, going back to like, you know, being optimistic and, uh, you know, anytime I lose a fight, the, the last thing I want is like any sympathy. I don't want few people to feel bad for me. And I always take away lessons. And honestly, that chaos loss, is what gives me so much confidence for this Pettis fight because like I studied tape on chaos. I know his skill set. I know how much time he's spent training the odds makers. You know, he was like a plus 450 dog. There were two takeaways I had from that fight. One, if chaos can beat me, I can beat anybody. Like anyone can beat anyone in MMA. Like I can beat Pettis. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a, a decent underdog in this fight too. Uh, on the on the on the bookmakers and i actually prefer that you know more to win less to lose and uh, and two i was like why why am i doing this now now granted i really enjoy the training and the hardship and the camaraderie and the fight camps but like you know i would you know for that for that you know chaos fight camp the diego lima fight camp you know i drove to and from dallas every week for eight weeks you know had to stay in hotels and just like stay away from the family and the gym, but there's like a lot of sacrifice that again, I'm happy to do, but it, it starts to get taxing around like week six, week seven, week eight. And I was like, why am I going, why am I like torturing myself? And there was one defining answer. It wasn't for money. It wasn't for notoriety. It was uh, because it's fun. Like it's, it's to experience life in its most extreme state. And like, and what I found is these fights, you know, like if you go get into like a street fight, like an altercation out in a bar and a parking lot, whatever, it's a, it's more sinister. You know, you have like the, the implication of the law getting arrested. You have like potentially getting, you know, a weapon pulled on you, getting damaged, getting jumped, whatever. It's, it's, it's not a fun feeling. Whereas these, these MMA fights, it's uh it's based around like glory and, 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 and like prize money. So your opponent signed up for the potential risk. You're getting paid handsomely for it. You know, I have the support of all the fans and my teammates and my family. It's it's a much more glorious, positive feel. And then experiencing like the adrenaline rush, the excitement, sometimes the fear. It's just like really raw emotion. And what I what I did my last fight against Reese is I tried not to censor any of that emotion. And I tried to feel everything I could and it gave me more control. Normally I would choose like the most hardcore walkout song I can find, which is usually on a Marth. But uh, this time I chose something like a little more melodic, a little lighter hearted. And, uh, you know, right before my walkout song came on, I was getting into that like death or victory mentality. And then when the song came on, I like took a breath and I told myself, I was like, I want to put on a master class of technique and, and control this fight and be patient and find my range and be technical. And I feel like I was able to, to turn that flip. Whereas when I fought chaos, you know, I felt the energy of my home crowd and I was like, I was I accepted the brawl and like paid the ultimate price for it. I made the decision to, to fight like that. And it, it got out of hand quick. And I'm like, I, I can accept that responsibility and learn from my lessons, but I won't make that mistake again. And I just feel like I'm in such a serene state in my career right now in terms of like not only decision-making, but like control of the, of the mental side of it, which I feel has always been a strong suit of mine. And, uh, and it's just, I feel like everything's like on the up and up right now, which is great. Everything's just getting stronger than it was before. Did not having the crowd at the apex when you fought Reese, did that help in that process? Um, I like the crowd. I like the energy. Um, and I like the, I like hearing 
when somebody gets dropped, you know, if, it's, if I'm the one getting dropped, you usually don't hear anything because you go on a defense mode. But like when you hit someone or drop someone, it's cool here in the crowd because it like encourages you to finish. It encourages me to try to finish. Um, I, I actually I don't want to say I prefer the apex, but but I really do enjoy it. I enjoy the the, the small octagon actually feels normal because people are asking, you know, what do you like better, the big the big cage or the small cage? And I don't, I don't really know. When I'm in the big cage, it feels really big. When I'm in the small cage, it feels normal, like fighting on the local scene again. And it's still a pretty big cage, so I like the close quarters nature of it. And I like, I just, I like the the martial arts aspect. It's, you know, it, it makes it seem like it's more for like martial arts credit than glory because there's not a bunch of fans there. And I just kind of appreciate that. Plus. I always enjoyed the hardship of fights. So like hearing my opponent breathe heavy, hearing him quit, get hurt, whatever, has always been like a fun psychological aspect that I try to delve into every time. And this makes that a little bit easier. So like you talked about earlier, not only are you competing on this card, you're sharing it with some teammates, including Jeff Neal, who is headlining against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. I mean, both of you guys just have these massive fights against these big names. I mean, this has to be a pretty cool moment, not just for you, but for the entire team, right? Yeah, last night, Coach was was, was walking us through it. And I'll tell you, I wonder how many rounds I did yesterday with Jeff. We did like an hour of like strategy, movement, fit, and work. And then we did our hard sparring work. I must have done seven or eight rounds with them. And I'll tell you, I'm glad I'm not Wonder Boy. Jeff is sharp right now um and man that's a that's a i was telling jeff too i was like i was like buddy i know i'm biased i was like but of all the welterweights in the ufc you're the last person i'd ever want to fight and granted i do a lot of rounds with them so i know how bad things can go and man he that, that guy's a he's something special man i can't wait to see him become champion you know it's awesome he's headlining the card i'm, I'm honored to be on the main card my first time being on a main card fighting pettis of all people so you know training with jeff yesterday i had to be wonder boy he was he was being pettis and uh, it was just a really fun kind of like last i guess not our last hard day but like one of our last hard sessions for this fight camp and i i got on the i got on the lucky and i only had two weeks of hard work i know he's been grinding out for you know close to two months now and uh and yeah it's it's really cool you know we kind of like feed off of each other's energy and, uh, and I'm really excited to, to have, you know, friends to hang out with while we're at, you know, COVID in, in Vegas for the week and all that fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to fight week on Tuesday. I mean, I know you haven't had a lot of time since Penn went to paper, but have you talked to Diego Fajeda at all? Because I know he fought Anthony earlier. He's a Fortis guy as well. Came the first man to submit him back in January on that Connor Cowboy card. That has to build like a little more confidence knowing that there is sort of a blueprint that your team has put together in, in order to beat him. But have you talked to Diego at all about this fight? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've spoken a bit. Uh, I, Coach has more so been like the bridge between our experiences. And, you know, Carlos Diego Fiera, he and I have different styles. So, you know, Coach Safe has done a good job kind of implementing what we're good at to win this fight. And uh, and CDF is the man. I remember watching that fight with my friends at home. If I'm not mistaken, that was in January of this year. Yeah. And, uh, and man, I was hyping him up. And, uh, you know, I teach quite a bit of jujitsu and, uh, Carlos Diego Fiera used a high crotch entry to a body lock, to a back take, which in my opinion is one of the best wrestling entries with a single leg or a high crotch into like a jujitsu finish with the body lock drag down back takes. And I'm just a big fan of that style. And I always use that fight in particular as a reference to my students when teaching. So I'm very familiar with like the routes in that fight. And, uh, and man, we kind of dodged each other because CDF is fighting uh, Burrell Dariush yeah. pretty soon. So I know he'll be starting camp soon. So I was at Fortis, you know, while he was doing his thing it, uh, on the border. And I know he'll be going up to Fortis here soon for, you know, his eight weeks. And we're actually going to have crossed paths, which is sad. But when he did fight Pettis, I was actually showing up just to be a good teammate and help the guys out. So I actually had to emulate Pettis for him a couple of times. So yeah, I was very much so involved in that camp. And it's just, it's just good to have some comfortability, you know, with the style of the guy I'm fighting and knowing that a teammate beat him is, is helpful. A lot of people feel like Anthony is, I don't know, sort of at the end of the line, like they'll look at a topology page more than his fights himself and be like, Oh, he's lost four out of seven. But like, if you, if you take a deeper look at who he's lost to, it's Diego. Uh, he was just a monster. I think he could be a bre like a complete breakout guy at 55 this, and in 2021. He lost to Nate, lost to Ferguson in a fight that I don't think gets enough credit 
as, as far as entertaining fights. And then Dustin and Max and so forth and so on. I mean, he's losing to the best of the best. And last year, he Superman punched KO'd Wonderboy Thompson into the shadow realm. <laughs> well, well, maybe his like his best days are behind him. Like maybe he's not going to be fighting for a belt anytime soon. Still a very dangerous guy with a big name, right? I mean, this is certainly a guy you can't sleep on. And I'm sure that you're keeping that in mind, right? Hell no. Dude, even Reese McKee, I was thinking was the most dangerous man on the planet when I fight him. I, I am. I, I try to be as self-aware as possible. And, and one thing that certain coaches that I've had in the past would do is they would like – like hype me up and kind of like downplay my opponents and coming up in the ranks. I never did that. I would always envision my opponents to be these big monsters. Cause I fought some big ass welterweights in my day. And when I would see him at weigh-ins, I'm like, I'm like Matt, my strike coach, I'm like, dude, this dude's small. And he looks at me, he's like, dude, he's not that small. And I'm like, yeah, but he's smaller than I envisioned him to be. So I always like, I would always make my opponents actually bigger and better than they really were. So when I actually got to fight them, it wasn't as hard as I imagined opposed to being like, oh, you know, this dude's coming off a loss. He's old. He sucks. And if you expect him to be bad and in the fight, they're better than you expect. Then you're like, oh, I misprepared. So I've always tried to do the opposite. So I know I'm fighting the best Anthony Pettis that there's ever been. And I keep glancing over. And I got my, my computer right next to me. And I have the typology page. And just, just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read off. You know, he got a, a loss to Barboza. Barboza's the man. He's got a win over Charles Oliveira, who is, you know, a contender. He's got a loss to Holloway, who's the, the best. He's got a win over Jim Miller, a loss to Poye, who's the best. A win over Chiesa, who is a good grappler. A loss to Tiford. No one wants to fight the boogeyman. A knockout <laughs> over Thompson. And then a, a loss to Diaz, a loss to CDF, and a win over Cerrone. And then my name is at the top. Just like being on this list of these like legendary fighters, it brings me such pride. And uh, and again, it makes me want to like jump at this opportunity, you know, like head first with both hands up, man. I I, I can't wait. And uh, and again, I'm not. I mean, if there's a, if there's any opponent I've ever had to not overlook, it's Pettis, and I'm certainly not doing that. You mentioned self awareness. You're a very self aware guy. If you go out there and you beat a guy like Anthony Pettis next Saturday and you do so impressively, do you allow yourself to think about where a win over Anthony can take you? Like, do you allow, allow yourself to get to that place or are you just solely focused on Pettis December 19th and nothing more? I mean, yeah, there, you know, it opens the floodgates every night since I've taken this fight as I lay in bed before I go to sleep. I just imagine what if it opens up like an endless possibility of fights. And, uh, and again, naturally. So like one thing my coach was saying and, I, and he, he put into words exactly what I was thinking, like celebrating, getting the fight is not the goal. Celebrating the victory is, is, is what I need to focus most on. And that is the hardest task at hand. But uh, there's just no telling. Like I've already looked through the UFC's top 15 welterweights and I'm like, man, this would be a cool fight. That'd be a cool fight. And, uh, and again, just like winning this fight is what is going to get me to the next level of my career. And I, and I just, and the fact that, you know, they even asked me my name, like matchmakers to fight Pettis already puts me there, which is great, but like to, more to prove to myself than anything else, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to win this fight. Like I'm going to, I'm going to take it to him and take it from him and win this fight. Like I will, I am willing to give my life to take his on the 19th. And, and I know Pettis is a gamer. But if he's not like ready to, to fight to the death, then it's going to be a rough fight. How do you how, how do you see this thing going down? Like, I'm, I know you, you feel like you're walking out with your hand raised, but is there like a certain vision you have before your, your eyes shut tight when you go to sleep? Because I'm sure you've seen this fight end in a million different ways and go go down in a million different ways since you you signed the contract. How do you kind of what, what's sort of the consistent vision in your mind? I, mean, I always just envision knockouts ever since I started training, you know, in every interview, I've told myself this just one to not give anything away, but two to hopefully strike some fear into the hearts of my opponents. But I'm always gunning for a knockout. Best case scenario, I score a knockout. But in this fight, I I'm like planning on like a three round war decision victory with my primary goal to do as much damage within 15 minutes as possible. And with that goal, I'm hoping the finish will present itself. But at this high level, my I'm going to try to make zero mistakes and just and 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 find my times to be offensive and and just really again just try to put on a master class of of mixed martial arts is, is my goal. So I mean, I'm looking for like a third round finish. If anything, just to make sure if the first round goes and the second round goes, I'm not like 
you know, dang, I didn't, I didn't do what I was hoping to do. So I was playing for a third round, a third round grind. Have you visualized like the walkouts and stuff? Cause I know like there, there are fighters who like will visualize every second of it, even the walkout. Cause I'm sure you're probably going to walk out first and he'll walk out second. So you're going to watch him walk to the cage and it becomes just like this real thing, right? Yeah. You know what? I got two, two hours of octagon time. I've made the walk 11 times. I, I do envision that a lot. I'm still on the fence of my walkout song, but which is not, you know, I, I couldn't really care, but it's just, right. it's a kind of a fun aspect. Plus I've actually gotten to know some of these bands because they're like a little less mainstream than like most. But, uh, but yeah, I, I've envisioned that a million times and, uh, I really can't wait to be in Vegas, you know, going to the UFC PI to train a bit, you know, they have the octagon there. It's just, it's just cool to be in that environment. It's just cool to be in the UFC, man. It's, and I plan on being there for, at least another five years, you know, and, and then I'll, I'll rearrange my goals accordingly. But it's a bit, it's been a blast, man. And like, it's funny, like the longer I've been with the company, it seems like the more opportunities I'm getting and I'm starting to like see the same employees and have more conversations with Sean and Dana and Mick. It's just nice. It's nice being kind of a mainstay. Great stuff from the great white Alex Morano. Really enjoyed that conversation. First time I've actually chatted with him in an interview setting since his win over Kyle Noak in his UFC debut. It has been a while ago. Uh, that is a really interesting fight on December 19th. At first, I, I think I, I reacted to the booking between Murano and Pettis like everybody else, which is just, just like, what? Really? But the more I think about it, the more I like that fight. It's a really good one heading into the final card of the year for the UFC. We move ahead to my old friend, New England native, Tyson Chartier, the manager and the coach of... Guys like Calvin Cater, like Rob Font, amongst many others. I figured we were more than, than overdue getting him back on the program. So here he is on What the Heck. All right, back on the program is actually the first man I interviewed when I came over to MMA Fighting earlier this year. And so much has changed since then. The manager, coach, one of the faces of the New England cartel. He's wearing the hat right now. Tyson Charty are back on the program. And look at this setup, man. Unbelievable. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good, man. I got, finally got the wife to decorate the office. It's nice to have a... Uh, the, the, the wife kind of did this, too. I still got some work to do. Yours is a little more put together than mine, but it's looking looking pretty sharp. When, when did it get completed over there? Uh, we had had the stuff in here for probably six months, and then a couple weeks ago, the UFC cameras were going to be here doing a, a big shoot on the team. So my wife uh, thought it would look nice to finally finish it for them, and they did a bunch of interviews in here as well. Very cool. Well, you have become one of the busiest guys in the sport over the last several months, Tyson. Between I'm seeing you in ESPN articles everywhere before these fight cards. You've been all over the place. F fight Island, Jacksonville. Cater had a massive year. Rob Font's getting ready to fight December 19th. Peter Barrett's fighting Chase Hooper this weekend. It's been a crazy year for you for like a number of reasons, has it not? Yeah, it's been, you know, I would say it, there's good busy and bad busy. And uh, this year has been a tough year for a lot of reasons on a lot of people, but I've been good busy. So I've been blessed. I've been fortunate that, you know, I still get to work and my guys, you know, they're all still climbing the ranks and, you know, just one fight at a time, but it's, it's been a great 2020 overall. I can't complain. By the way, I just, I just thought about this happy 10th anniversary to you. I think around a week or so ago is the 10 year anniversary of your first professional fight. CS three. Is that right? Yeah. It was like CS two or three. It was like a Thursday night fight. It was, it was weird, but, uh, I was fortunate enough to get the, get the win. And, uh, yeah, you know, you learned a lot from those days back in. There was a time when I was a fighter too, so it's uh, it's funny to think back on those days. Is that the kind of thing you remember, like a fight like that, like frame by frame, because it was a pro debut and it was a big deal, or do you just remember like big, like big parts of the fight? I I remember like big parts of the fight. Like I remember I got hip tossed the first round. I got mounted the whole time, and I was like, man, I got freaking hip tossed. That's embarrassing, and I'm mounted, and you know, like yeah, I was fortunate enough to come back and get the win, but. Yeah, you just, I just kind of remember it as a part of my past that's, you know, help, helping me now. And uh, I don't dwell on the wins and the losses too much. It's more about the experiences and the memories I made. And, you know, every now and then my, you know, my kids are getting old enough now where they can watch one of the fights and be like, oh, daddy, you, you fight too like Uncle Calvin. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of cool for them to be able to go back and see that. It's pretty, it's crazy, pretty crazy to like think about this year because, Rob and Calvin have been telling me for the past few years in different interviews that, you know, we want to be the fifth sports team in New England. Like it's not 
it's not there yet, I would say, but to see it start to get closer and closer and get more buzz, not just locally, but even across the sport as a manager and a coach, someone who's like right in the fire with these guys, what has that been like to watch unfold this year? Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's finally like, you know, I'd say nine, 10, 11 years ago, I had this, this vision of how things could be different and little by little, like, you know, we started just making little changes, little changes. And, you know, three years ago, it became kind of official. Hey, we're going to make a run at this different way of doing things. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have high level athletes like Robin Calvin that are making me look good in it and, uh, making the team look good. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like all the hard work's already paying, you know, finally paying off, you know, like I said, the UFC sent cameras out here last week for three days to do a little story on the team. Um, I think they're ca- kind of catching on that we're doing a little bit different and we're having success. You know, you see Calvin's run, you know, Rob's on a two fight win streak. He's coming back fighting the number three guy next week uh, in Marlon Marais. So I, I think they're kind of taking notice of like, wow, like it's this little niche up in New England kind of just sticking to themselves, but the, it's working. Let's see what's going on. Was it kind of surreal having the, the cameras in the house and, and filming all these, these vignettes and videos and stuff? Was it, was it kind of surreal? Like you, you probably weren't like over, you probably were like settled with it being like, Oh, we made it, but it's got to feel good knowing that there, there is that interest. Right. Yeah. I mean, we always say for the team, it's, it's about hitting those checkpoints. You know, we're trying to enjoy this journey. We're trying to chase, you know, two belts for these guys. And, you know, it's always one fight at a time, but every now and then it is kind of cool to take a step back, reflect on how far we've come and, and the things that we're doing. And we always say that, you know, we just hit another checkpoint and, you know, having the UFC recognize us as a team that's up and coming and, um, you know, want to invest money into sending a team out here to kind of document it. It's, uh, you know, it, it's a good checkpoint, It's but it, it doesn't matter if we don't win. Right. You know, so it's cool to, to experience and five years ago, I think I would have thought this was the coolest thing ever. But as we keep climbing the ladder, it's it's just another part of what we're trying to accomplish. And, and those things are going to come along with it. We mentioned Peter Barrett back in the octagon on Saturday. The man has been a staple in New England on the scene for a long time now. Exciting fighter. He's overcome a lot in and out of the cage. He had that crazy fight with Yusuf Zalal in his debut. Now he gets a sophomore appearance against a young whippersnapper in Chase Hoopers. He's looking to get back in the win column himself. How is Pete feeling just days away from this one? He's good. I just uh, I was texting with him. He just landed in uh, Vegas. So he's checking in with the UFC now. Um, he feels good, man. He, he, he said he had a good camp. Um, he feels good. His weight's on point. Um, obviously this is going to be a clash of styles. I think, I think Chase Hooper knows that he can't stand with Peter and that his best chance is to probably try to go to the ground. But I think a lot of times people forget that, you know, Pete was a decent high school wrestler and he's got decent MMA wrestling. So, um, you know, it's a tall task for Chase Hooper. I, it, it's a fight that I expect Pete to win. And, uh, you know, Chase has got a bit of a big name, so it's, a, it's kind of a good, um, a good fight for Pete to kind of put himself on the map and, you know, get a little bit more recognition. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause one thing I think young fighters can learn from Pete, the man knows how to brand himself, Tyson. Like he's constantly promoting the slippery brand on social media. He's doing videos, got t-shirts, like every single fight. Like he may not be like a household name around the globe yet, but he's certainly like setting himself up to become one. Should he take that next couple of steps forward in his career? Right. Like he's, he's planting those seeds, so to speak. Yeah. He, he's great with self promotion. He's got a really good kind of a cult following locally and it just keeps growing with every fight. And, um, I think the thing with you get with Pete is you feel like you're along for the ride with him, Even if you're never on the mats with him or at a fight, you feel like you're part of the journey because he's pretty good with social media and keeping everybody updated. And, um, you know, he's just a real guy. So, I think people that resonates with a lot of people and, and obviously he's got a, a really cool fighting style, you know, he likes to go out there and kind of like Chris Lee and let it bang and take one to give one. And just, you know, he's always in a, he's always in an excited fight. So that's this Saturday, next Saturday, you mentioned it, Rob font back in the octagon tore his ACL around a year ago, almost a year to the day against Ricky Simone, getting that win in DC. He's been rehabbing, just waiting for his chance. And he gets Marlon Marias, the former WSOF champion, former UFC title challenger for his comeback fight. He must have been beside himself when he found that out, was he not? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people coming off a layoff are going to kind of look for that, like, you know, builder fight to come back, to kind of get your feet wet, you know, knock off the ring rest type thing. Not Rob. I mean, this is Rob's third one-year layoff in the UFC, unfortunately. Um, he came back last year, 
and beat Ricky Simone on a one-year layoff. And then now he gets to come back and fight Marlon Marais. And he, Rob's been in the rankings for like four or five years now. And uh, he just hasn't got that blue chip win. You know, we had the chance against Lineker. We had the chance against Munoz. Unfortunately, he falls short. So fair time's a charm. We get to fight the number three guy. I think we're catching him at the right time. You know, he's coming off a loss. He's, he's going to be hungry. So we're expecting the best Marlon Marais. And, um, you know, Rob's one of those guys that he's got an innate ability to get better through an injury. You know, it's been a year that he's rehabbing the ACL, but he, he's focused on, uh, you know, a lot of video, a lot of, um, a lot of coaching and a lot of studying and, and mental prep. So, you know, going into this fight next week, I mean, he looks just as good as he did going into the Ricky Simone fight, if not better. What has it been like kind of watching him come back? You know, you, you mentioned he's watching videos. He's finding ways, even though he couldn't physically do a lot of things to improve his mindset, improve his fight IQ, especially seeing the, the success Calvin's been having this year. That had to have lit an even bigger fire under him, right? <clears throat> yeah, I think a little bit of nostalgia because like, Rob was the first guy I had in the UFC and the first guy I made that UFC walk with. And then to see him on the sidelines last year and then come back, it's kind of like, we're getting the team back together. You know, me, Calvin are going to walk Rob down the cage next week. And, you know, I, I've missed that. It's always, you know, he, it's always different with your first, right. He's like my oldest child. So it's, uh, I'm excited to get back in there with him and, and, you know, for him to go for that third win in a row. And I think the past year, him being part of Calvin's camps and getting to walk Calvin to the cage twice as the main event. And, um, you know, against Stevens right after the COVID with the, you know, a lot of eyes on us. I think that's got to help him with uh, the mental prep for his fight. Cause he's made that walk and cornered in front of those empty arenas. So it's not going to be super foreign to him. He's done it. He's seen Calvin in those big pressure moments and, you know, he gets hyped up and wishes it was, you know, wishes it was him. So I think, um, Calvin's rise over the last year is just going to pull, pull Rob forward. And then Rob will go forward and pull Calvin up with him. And they just keep kind of leapfrogging each other. It's always great to see in a, in a team environment like that. And obviously if he beats Marlon next re weekend, he's right there. We're starting to have big names in the conversation. Marlon's a big name itself, but let's talk about Calvin Cater because he got the fight that everyone in the universe wanted to see. Everyone wanted to see Cater versus Holloway. And we're going to see that on January 16th. And what a massive fight that is. Calvin, is so funny. He's got the Belichick mentality. It's business. It is what it is. It's on to whoever opponent X is. Was his reaction to this booking with Max different than any of the other ones? Like, I mean, former champion, number one ranked guy in the division, a guy that a lot of people feel is the best 45er of all time for a guy who <laughs> like Calvin, who has this, like, how do I want to put this? Like a reserved intensity to him. Was there like any giddiness to him finding out that he's fighting Max Holloway? <laughs> No, he was he was more excited that the fight might be in Vegas. <laughs> he's, he just, he's never fought in Las Vegas. It's been like a, a a goal of his to fight in Vegas. So he was finally excited because the originally, you know, it looks like the fight might be in Vegas now. It looks like it might be in Fight Island. Who knows? But um, you know, he was just so excited. He's like, so in Vegas? Did I get to fight in Vegas? He's like, all right. And then he goes, five rounds. I go, yep. He goes, all right. And then the next thing he's like, what's the pay? <laughs> Cause he didn't even know where he was at in his contract. So, um, yeah, no, he, you get what you get with Calvin. Like he just wants to kill the next person in front of him. If, if it was Max, that's great. If it was zombie or Ortega or whoever, you know, it's going to be the same reaction. He just kind of like, all right, well, you know, I've been working the whole time. Just tell me who I'm fighting. And, uh, I think that's what makes him dangerous too, is that he's not going to get any more nervous because it's Max, just like he's not going to get any more excited. I remember I was talking to you about uh, the Dan Ige booking, and I think I talked to Kevin about this as well. It was just um, the, the name came across and he just looked to you and said, what do you think? Like, do you think I should do this? And you said, sure, let's do a main event fight, Alan. Why not? And he was just like, all right, let's go. Yeah, and that was, that was it. I think, his, I think his exact words were, uh, do you, if you think it's the move, let's do it. And I was like, I think it's the right move and here's why. And we kind of had a list of reasons and um, it made sense. And it, unfortunately it worked out. It was a calculated risk to fight that low, but it earned us this opportunity here. You know, had we not taken that, maybe we haven't fought yet since Steven. So I think, uh, you know, it, obviously in hindsight, it was the right move, right? Uh, we got a you know a nice win. We dominated in the fourth and the fifth round, showed everybody that we're headliner and showed everybody that we're worthy of uh, fighting the GOAT, the number one guy, uh, probably in a contender fight. I remember texting with you after Dana White announced that the fight between Zabit and Yair Rodriguez 
was no longer happening. I think it was like August 29th or something like that. And you guys had called, you went on social media, called for the opportunity to step in and fight. And when you found out Zabit was not going to stay on the card and ultimately like kind of declined the fight, maybe he was holding out hope for a title shot. You said something like, all right, cool, no problem. But don't be surprised if you get left behind playing this card. And now with the whole Yair suspension and everything, Zabit is going to not, he's not going to have a single fight this year. So you kind of, kind of hit that one on the head. You weren't like being disrespectful at all. You're just like, dude, all right, I get it. But if, if we pass you by, can't get mad. Yeah. You can politic your way to a title shot or you can earn it. And this team's always going to earn it. You know, we're not, we don't get favors from the UFC. We earn everything we get. And that's not said in like a, an annoying way. Like, you know, Calvin's a fighter, Rob's a fighter. And, and, um, you know, I'm a, a competitive coach, manager, whatever you want to call me. And, um, we're going to earn that shot, you know, that's what, and I meant that when I said that to Rizvan, you know, as a beats Russian manager and, you know, I was like, Hey, go ahead. You know, if you guys are fighting for a title fight, you know, you guys are going to sit around and lobby for that. Go ahead. But don't be surprised if, if we go and get a big fight this fall or winter and leapfrog you. Cause I, I don't think there's any scenario where we can go beat max the number one contender in a main in a five round fight after just beating Ige in a five round fight, who's on a six fight win streak and then knocking out Jeremy Stevens the way we did since fighting Zabit and he's done nothing. I, I don't think there's any way that Zabit could lobby for a title shot over Calvin. Agreed. There's no way if Calvin wins that fight, he's fighting for the belt next. Like his next fight will I mean, be for the belt. But there's, there's a lot of politics in MMA. So, <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, all we can do, we, our whole team motto is we focus on what we can control. All we can control right now is next week beating Marlon Marais and then on January 16th beating beating Max Holloway and then what comes of it comes of it. You know, we'll lobby for what we need. You know, we'll try to play politics, but we're going to let our work speak for itself in the same regard. Like, you know, you, you can't argue that if you beat Max Holloway in a main event that you don't deserve a title shot. So, As um. Like as a coach, are you enjoying like looking at film and and, and kind of studying tendencies on guys like like Marais, guys like Holloway? Like that must jazz you up to try to like put these puzzle pieces in place, right? Yeah, man. It's like I'm trying to solve math equations over here. Like uh, you know, I got three monitors sitting here right in front of me. This is the lab where I do all my work, and I'm just looking for tendencies and looking for habits. And uh, you know, we see some holes, and I and I and I really think Calvin's style is suited to beat someone like Max, you know, you see Max has struggled with guys like Dustin Poirier. Yeah. He's a southpaw, but that power, you could argue that Calvin has just as much power as Dustin does. Um, you know, Calvin's a sharp shooter and, and, you know, it's, I think it's kind of Calvin's fight to lose, you know, it's going to come down to volume. You know, if Calvin just waits and tries to pick his shots, yeah, maybe Max could outpoint us. But if Calvin shows up ready to throw, ready to match volume, I just don't see how Max is going to be able to deal with, with our power, with our cardio. Like, you know, we kind of match them everywhere. The only place someone could argue that Max has the advantage over Calvin is they're going to say, well, the experience. Okay, cool. Calvin's got 25 fights too. Yeah. The big fight experience. Cool. Calvin's had two main events in the last year. Like, um, you know, we're the young, hungry prospect, even though we're older than him, uh, you know, we're the, the up and coming prospects. So it puts a little bit more pressure on Max and, um, you know, then people could argue that Max is, you know, better with volume and this and that, but that's not, that's not something that's hard to change. Calvin goes out there and just throws combos and, and, and gets in his face. Like Max going to have to deal with that power. And uh, if Max wants to do what he did with uh, Lamas and stand in the middle, point to the ground and fight in a phone booth, that's a battle he's going to lose every day with Calvin. So I think Max has to fight real smart going against someone like Calvin. I think we got just as many weapons, but we also have the power advantage. Um, we're longer, you know, I think we got a three inch reach advantage and I just think, you know, it's our time. So, uh, I'm excited about the challenge of breaking down video on probably one of the best 45ers to ever fight in this sport and try to knock them out. You have guys in both divisions, you know, font and, and cater both of these divisions, Bantamweight and in 45, in my opinion, like from one to whoever the lowest ranked guy is. Like light, like if you look at lightweight, welterweight, those divisions are great, but they're very top heavy. But bantamweight and featherweight are deeper divisions overall, in my opinion. Like if you bought stock in either division, you're in good shape. Like you're probably gonna net a, a pretty tidy profit. What division do you think is better overall? Thirty five or forty five from like a fan's perspective? 
Man, I, I do agree. I think they're the two most exciting divisions right now. There's a lot of juice. There's a lot of prospects. There's a lot of people even not ranked in the top 10 that you think could fight for a title. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's right now it's kind of exciting with 35 just because I think some of those guys are staying a little busier. 45, you're starting to see the guys get to the top five and they want to sit around, you know? There hasn't been a lot of activity. I mean, finally, Zombie and Ortega fought, you know, that kind of shook a lo- things up a little bit, but this, it's a little stale, you know? Um, so I, I think 35 is exciting. I was excited to see Jan versus uh, um, Sterling, you know, we'll see, hopefully that gets rebooked. And then, um, you know, Cruz fighting someone like Kenny. Kenny's a dark horse. Like he's just, you know, don't count him out against Cruz. It's a weird fight when you look at it on paper, but, you know, Kenny's really good. So, and then you got guys like, you know, you know, Ricky Simone who aren't even ranked, you know, and then Chio verified now though, like there, there's a bunch of good fights out there, you know? And then, uh, yes, I go with 35 just because I think it's like maybe a little bit deeper and it's more active right now. But, um, yeah, I mean, we beat, we go and beat the number three Marlon Marais. I think that worst case scenario puts us at number six, you know, cause maybe they'll pull him down, move up, uh, Frankie and, whoever else is up there with them, uh, Frankie and Munoz, and maybe we'll move to, you know, six or whatever. But, you know, I think we're in a really good spot. If we beat Marlon and we're kind of like right where Calvin's at now, one fight away from a title shot or because of COVID, you know, you could be the fill in for the next title shot. That's true. Who, why is this driving me crazy? You have a fighter fighting Thursday, right? For Bellator? I have three. Three so of them. Uh, Nate Andrews making his Bellator debut That's on right. the main card. Yeah. So he just signed with them. And then I have uh, Justin Sumter on the undercard. He's fighting uh, Romero Cotton. And then I have uh, um, Cameron Lashinov, who's 5-0 and with Bellator. But this is his, uh, you know, he's not signed with him. So this is his last fight option on that. And uh, so he can go 6-0 and against uh, 9-0. I, I messed up the kid's name. It's a Russian kid. Shamil Nikiev or something. Um, but he's going against a kid who's 9-0. and He gets that win. He'll be 6-0 and with Bellator. 170 on a, uh, I think at that point it'd be a nine fight win streak. It'd be 11 and two. There's big things coming for him. You know, there, he speaks Russian, English, and a little Uzbek. Um, he's got dual citizenship with here in Russia. And um, he's got a huge following in Turkey because that's where his parents are from. So I think he's just like a guy that anybody would be lucky to have on their roster because he's just so unique. And he's got a cool fighting style. Like or he doesn't mind banging, but he's got great jujitsu. So yeah, you can check out. Uh, it's gonna be a big, uh, big next month or so for for the squad. Five weeks, six weeks or so. Uh, last thing, I mean, like I said, you're all over the place. You're getting asked about fight picks and all these things. You're an, you're like an analyst and a coach at the same time. You're all over ESPN. Fighter of the year. All right. If Davis and Figueroa wins on Saturday and retains the title, is he the fighter of the year? Is this a no brainer? That makes him three now this year. Four now. He beat four now. Who, who did he beat before he beat? Uh... The two wins against um, what's the name? It's two Benavides, two Benavides wins. Benavides. So it's Benavides, Benavides, uh, and, then, and then he just won. Perez. Okay, yeah. yeah. Man, I don't see. I agree. It could be fight of the year, but he missed weight, you know. So I, I feel like you get penalized for that. So I don't know who else would be a good good for fight of the year. You got Kamza. He If he had gotten that win, I think that would have been a good uh, thing for him. I, I think if Yusuf would have won that last fight, he'd be kind of. You know, you throw him in there. What he would have been like three or four and zero in the UFC this year. It's Kevin it's Holland, kind of a newcomer. Kevin Holland's got a lot of juice right now. Yeah, I don't know. I, Jan Jan Blahovich. Yeah, two fights. I don't know. I don't know. I, well, Brand, what if Brandon Moreno wins? Yeah, that's. I like him. He's a, he's always so smiley, so nice. I, on our team, twenty twenty doesn't end until January sixteenth because <laughs> our goal with Calvin was three and zero. Um, three and zero in 20, 2020 and uh, he's gone two and zero, and now he's getting that twenty twenty point two fight on uh, January sixteenth. So if he wins that, in our head he'll be three and zero in twenty twenty twenty. So uh, I'll give Calvin the fight of the year. There you go. I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to throw a weird theory at you and I haven't told anybody this. You're the first person I'm telling. So this is a, this is a Tyson Charter exclusive for fighter of the year and under the radar pick. I don't think he wins. But I think he should be in the conversation and people are going to watch this and be like, Mike, what the hell are you talking about? What about Michael Chandler? One win over Benson Henderson, finished him. But who has made more of an impact in 2020 by doing nothing than Michael Chandler? 
Free agency was a huge story this year. Signs of the UFC, it's the backup fighter, left Tony Ferguson dangling for like a month. Dude, fight me. And Chandler just went radio silent. Just just healed out. Yeah. It's just an interesting theory. Yeah. I mean, I get what you're saying. Like he's had an impact. I don't I think you could say story of the year. Imp- yeah, all um, right. Fair enough. Yeah, you know. But fighter of the year, yeah, he hasn't fought. And I think people have seen, you know, Henderson and then he goes and loses his next fight. So I think it's kind of like a, how much is that? That win doesn't age as well now, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's good to see people doing, uh, you know, free agency and getting paid and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested to see who he fights in his debut. It's got to be Gagey, right? It's got to be. That'd be exciting. Yeah. Hell yeah, it would be. Just throw him right, throw him right after it. Put him, put him right on the Connor card. I think that's, that's what you do. I just don't know who else is there. Ferguson's fighting Oliveira. Mm, Dan Hooker, maybe. I mean, if it's going to be on Fight Island, it's an easier trek for him. Yeah. I'm, I mean, Chandler gets anybody at 55 is fun. Yeah. No, I, I'm excited to see him finally, uh, you know, kind of like how Eddie Alvarez was a few years back when he came in. You're excited to see how he does against this competition. So, yeah, he's solid. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see him fight Gaethje. That'd be a good one. I mean, and, uh, who you go with in that fight? <sighs> I don't know. It's hard to go. Gage is just such an animal, man. Like, I don't know. That's a, it's a tough fight. I, I think I would favor Gaethje like right now, but I don't know. I mean, when you have Chandler only had the one fight, he's probably as healthy as a horse right now. He's probably as healthy as walking into a fight. He may be in his entire career, which could be interesting. You like, like Rob, when you have all that time can only help and sharpen things up that maybe you didn't sharpen prior. So I like the matchup, especially if it hits the mat. But I mean, it's Chandler's a powerhouse. But man, if Gaethje starts starts getting off, it's real. It starts landing those leg kicks. It's really tough to beat that guy. Yeah, maybe I hope it happens, but anything's possible. That's you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> you get, you get. Listen, you got your own things to worry about. You got some big fights on the horizon. Rob Vaughn, you got Cater, you got Barrett, you got three guys for Bellator. Whole bunch of stuff going on, but uh. You're the man. You're the man. I don't think anyone's going to give you any shit about the hat this time, Tyson. You're, you're Fords. Yeah. You're good to go. I had to wear Ford because everybody called me Muffin Head last time. <laughs> I was like, I'm not used to being trolled. You know? That was like, no, one cares, no one cares what I say. They, you know, they all call me Muffin Head. I was like, oh, I'm going to come on. This is cool. Like, you guys got to, you know, I get to talk shop with you on, on here and your new podcast. And it was not, nothing I said was as a substance. They just wanted to talk about my gushy forehead. I, I have a gushy forehead, but what can you do? You know? We made up for it. Redemption, just like you wanted, right? That's right. You did it, man. I appreciate the time and uh, all the best to you. All the best to the squad, man. Such a good dude, that that Tyson Chartier. Glad to see him and the team start to get some recognition. It's been a long time coming. Been watching these guys do their thing for so long now. And finally, it's, it's all starting to come together. Of course, we did talk about Nate Andrews in that interview, and he was supposed to fight Gordy Yamauchi at tonight's Bellator event. But you may have seen this by now. Yamauchi missed weight by like seven pounds, just under seven pounds. That is just absolutely ridiculous. So that fight is off. It should have been off. And I'm told Nate Andrews is getting compensated, which he should be getting compensated. It's just just unfortunate. It, it really is. Come on. It was a tough fight to begin with. And then to, to, to have a guy miss weight by like seven pounds is just is just. Uh, unbelievable just unbelievable i was gonna say some some other mean words but i don't want to get in trouble with my kids jumping around right in front of me but uh we're getting ready to wrap up another edition of what the heck here on mmafighting.com thank you so much for checking out the show i've had some people hit me up on social media asking what they could do to help us out first off i guess i'll i'll say keep doing what you're doing keep watching keep listening the podcast numbers have been ridiculous this year just really really strong and that means a lot But to help out, tell a friend, tell two friends, your brother, your sister, your cousin, let them know what we're doing here. Not just this show, though, all the shows, Between the Links. Let me just just say something about Between the Links. I love this show. I love this show right here. This is like my baby. I protect it. I nurture it. I take care of it. But Between the Links is like when that baby that you protected and nurtured for all those years turns 21, and then you can go like, to the bar and drink beers with it and hang out and do some crazy stuff like 
between the links is that is just so much fun to do. So let people know about that one. Not everyone loves a great, like like a nice healthy debate, right? So let everyone know between the links. Of course, the A side, Jose Youngs and the crew. On to the next one, etc. Let them know, people. That's the stuff that that makes or breaks channels. We appreciate that. With that said, we will leave you with my chat with the great, the big ticket, Walt Harris. This was great. Uh, so happy for him that he got his shot on the broadcast at UFC Vegas 16. And I will say, I said this at the top, if you skipped ahead just because you wanted to hear Walt Harris, I understand that. We recorded this interview before UFC Vegas 16 went down. Okay, so while I was on the broadcast for UFC Vegas 15, Basically, this is like a week behind, all right? We talked about him being on the UFC Vegas 15 broadcast team. UFC Vegas 16 came and gone. You get it at this point, but we talked about that. It was really cool to see him up there looking dapper. Family, the tragic loss of his stepdaughter, Anaya Blanchard. We talked openly and honestly about that and how that sort of has translated to his fighting career. We're gonna start that chat in just a moment. Before we do that, again, thanks to all of you guys for watching and listening. Big thanks to Casey Lydon on the production, Jose Youngs and Alex Savas on the graphics and dealing with me being a pain in the butt every single week. And as always, have a heck of a week, everybody. Let's say goodbye with the big ticket himself, Walt Harris. All right, well, if you watched the UFC Vegas 15 broadcast this past Saturday night, you may have seen a well-dressed, well-spoken heavyweight contender on the desk that just knocked it out of the damn park. Wald Harris joins us this week on the program. Wald, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. You did a phenomenal job on Saturday Night Wall, looking like a couple Billy on top of that. How did you enjoy that experience of, of sitting on the desk and, and talking some fights with the crew? Oh, man, it was fun. I'll, I'll be honest. I'll, when I first got there, I was a little nervous. Um, you know, it's kind of overwhelming when you realize how much it actually goes into a, a TV production. But once I got the gist of it, man, it was uh, smooth sailing. What sorts of things might have might have thrown you off? Because watching on TV, you just think that you just sit up there and have a mic and answer questions. But like you said, it's a television broadcast and there's all sorts of different twists and turns that maybe you weren't prepared for. Well, the, for starters, um, you know, Friday night we did two shows and um, it was a the monkey wrench got thrown in the game when Curtis Blades and uh, Derek Lewis's fights got canceled. So um, the production had to go back in, rewrite the script, had to rewrite the order of the show. And then you have to re-prepare your information. And, um, you know, there's so much that you have to learn in such a short period of time. And you got to, you know, learn how to how to fill spaces and, you know, whether the information that you studied and that you took notes on is even pertinent to what's going on in the broadcast, man. I mean, it's it's a lot. And then there's a lot of words that you need to learn uh, in order to kind of, you know, understand what the producer's trying to tell you to do during the show. He's in your ear at the same time you're trying to speak. Um, you know, so it's it, it's a lot, man. But it is so it's so much fun for sure. In a way, I mean, because because I, I assume because you did so well, you'll probably do this again. In a way, is it almost beneficial that you kind of got thrown to the fire right off the bat, and there were some hiccups? So now that the next time, yeah. it's smooth sailing. Yeah, for sure. I definitely, um, you know, like I love challenges, and, and you know, being thrown in the mix early, and um, you know, not really knowing exactly what to do is exactly what I would could ask for because the next time like you said it'll be it'll be smooth sailing man it won't even be hard um and, and i'll be better prepared for it you know i'll know how to study and prepare my notes and you know we'll go from there is that something that you hoped would would be an option for you because it was one of those things honestly that i didn't really think about until i saw you up there but immediately i was like oh this is a great choice this is awesome this makes total sense was the broadcasting side of the fight game something that you had in mind to be a part of yeah, I've always, um, I mean, I've been a sports guy my whole life. I watch every sport, um, whether it's hockey, um, basketball, soccer. I I'm into everything. Um, in fact, right now I'm sitting here watching Stephen A. Like, <laughs> this sport, sports is my life, you know what I mean? So it's kind of a natural progression for me. Uh, my family's always felt like it, it was something that I need to do. And I, at first I kind of was like, oh, whatever. But then I started realizing just how much I do love sports and how much I know about sports. And I love talking and arguing and doing all those different things. So I feel like commentary was definitely a natural progression for me. And then like right off the bat, you're on ESPN. 
And I know like yeah, dude. myself growing up, like I watched Sports Center on a loop, like over and over and over again, seeing like yeah. the Dan Patrick's and the Olbermans and the the Stuart Scott's and, and folks like yeah. that. So that must have been pretty surreal for you as well. Yeah, dude. It was like kind of when I when I heard we were doing live, it's when like I was like, what? Like, dude, you're on ESPN, like this is huge. You know what I mean? Like most people that started out commentating, especially fighters, they usually kind of do a local circuit, you know, they kind of, you know, get their feet wet that way. And my very first time I was going on ESPN with Megan O'Levy and Michael Chiesa, who is he's 10 shows in, but the dude's like a pro, man. Like he's so good. Um and it was just, it was kind of overwhelming at the time. And I was just like grateful, you know, and that's all I could think of was just how grateful I was to be sitting up there doing that. I, I don't know if you saw it, but I, I saw the feedback on Twitter and social media and it, it was universal in, in praise for you and in, in your contributions on the broadcast. But how did ESPN, the UFC feel about, it? did they offer any feedback? Yeah. yeah. Um, I talked to uh, Zach Candido, the producer of the show, um, he he wanted me to smile more. He that was his <laughs> thing. He's like, dude, you gotta let that big pretty smile out. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, like, cause to be honest, the first day, like, I was I was confused as to how to approach it. You know, cause I just I didn't want my personality to like overtake the show. I didn't want to be too dominant. And then I'm I can be very very loud. You know, like I'm a my loud human being. Um, you you know, when I'm doing interviews, it's probably not as prevalent but when i'm like just having fun like it's it, i'm so loud so i was worried about being too loud on the mic because my mic sounded like it was too loud in my head and he was just like no it's okay he's like you actually need to yell a little bit more um you know he, he said um he wanted me to talk more which was crazy to me because i was like dang i talk too much so that was pretty cool to kind of like be told you need to talk more um you know, but that was about it, man. He was happy. Um, I think everybody was happy. Megan and, and Mike was super pumped. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to, to continuing and getting better at it, man, for sure. The card ended with Anthony Smith getting a quick submission win over Devin Clark. And, and for a guy who has had the year that, that he had dealing with a lot of adversity, he fought for a world title last year. He certainly needed that mm -hmm. win. What did you make of his performance, especially getting a main event slot a little more than 24 hours prior to that? After, like you mentioned, the, the Curtis Blades positive test. Man, I was I was impressed with Anthony, man. I mean, that dude is so resilient. Um, I've always been a fan of his and, and how he fights and how he approaches the game. Um, I thought he went in there and did exactly what he needed to do. I also thought Devin did what he needed to do. I think he just got a bit overwhelmed by the moment, which I kind of expected because I've been in that spot where you're you're coming off a, a tragic situation or you're going through something in that camp. And, you know, you, you, you want to perform so well that you kind of almost overdo it. And then you kind of miss steps in the middle of that fight. And, and I think that happened to me as well with Overeem. I, I, I heard him. And instead of me taking my time, I kind of rushed in and got blew my load. And I think I, I think Devin did the same thing. He kind of got wanted to get his hands on him, and, and then he got it. You know, got to the point where he was comfortable at, or where he was comfortable on the ground, and then he just made a mistake. And you can't make mistakes like that at the highest level, man. I mean, it, it just those guys are just too good. And I thought Anthony capitalized on it, and, and he won the fight. Yeah, he he looked great. It was something that he really needed. And you know how fans can be. Sometimes they give you the credit and then other times they're like, well, he fought a good, you know, not in the top 15, swips, switches off wins and loss in the UFC. Slow your roll. Don't get too excited. But if you're a guy like Anthony Smith, who, I mean, he's been in these situations before. He's dropped, you know, two or three in a row and then goes on these runs. Is this sort of the beginning of maybe a second title run for him? Or is just we, we need to slow roll him a little bit, just keep putting him up against you know, top 15 guys slowly bring him back up and just to see where he's at. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the slow, you know, process because I mean, he's been fast tracked once, you know what I mean? And we saw what happened in the end of that. Um, I think he's at a point in his career now where it, like he said, after in his post fight interview, fight the fights that are in front of him, you know what I mean? And I think he realizes that he got fast tracked last time and it may have been a little bit too much for him, put too much on his plate. Um, you know, so I think, let's fight by fight basis with him and see how, how it goes, you know, because only he knows exactly how he feels. And for him to say, take the fights in front of him, that's what, you know, I think that's what should be done. Were there any other performances on the card that, that got you fired up? Like outside of Anthony Smith, who sort of stole the show for you on Saturday? Um, Baeza, man, I called Baeza to a T bro. It's crazy. 
Um, I was in the back, and we were picking the fights, me and Michael. And I told Michael, I was like, bro, Baeza's striking is nasty. But I guarantee you, it doesn't get out of the second round. And and Sato will go to sleep. And he's like, no, I don't know, man. Sato's down there with Henry Hoof. And I think they're both going to fill each other out. It's going to go all three rounds. I said, I guarantee you, he puts him to sleep in the second round. And boom, <laughs> on cue. Second round, head and arm choke. I was like, and I looked over at him. Mike just got over like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I told you, dude. Like, I don't know. I, I, I should probably gamble. And uh, Megan was like, no, no gambling. You know, I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, I don't need to gamble. Um, but I was picking those fights like crazy, dude. I was like, man, that's kind of weird. I picked two of them exactly. I think it was that one and then um, the very first fight of the night. Um, no, it was uh, the G- JSP fight I picked. So I'm like, I don't know, man. I might have a future in Vegas. There you Some go, man. <laughs> we get you on all these different shows. Get you on the betting show. Because, I mean, JSP was was a surprising one because Kamaka looked so good in his first fight. It was so wild. And he was a heavy, under, uh, heavy favorite in that fight, too. And JSP, especially after the loss to Joe Lozon, weren't really sure – you know, what he was going to look like. It had been over a year since he fought, but to go in there, he's a huge 45-er. Massive. Massive, bro. So, he's so big. big. So big. And he was healthy, man. That's the thing I was banking on. I was like, all right, he fought those on at like 50%. His shoulder was screwed up. So uh, he's 100%. You know, although Kakamaka had a full camp and he was 100%, I felt like I just, JSP, man, he's tough. He's from the South, man. He's a dirty, dirty boy, so. I felt like he was going to be able to go in there and get it done, and he did, man. I was happy for him. Well, you did an amazing job on the broadcast. Hope to see you up there again. But in terms of your Octagon presence, we last saw, we last saw you compete in October against Alexander Volkov at UFC 254. Didn't go your way. First off, you know, being part of the Fight Island experience, such a unique time, especially with everything going on in 2020, getting to be on a card like that. What was that experience like for you? Man, it was insane. Um, the reception over there was amazing. The people were amazing. Um, you know, it was just a great, a great experience for me because I've always wanted to go over there and, and see that side of the world. Albeit, you know, it was in a pandemic, so it, it wasn't at full capacity. Um, I, I just, I had a great time, man. I, I enjoyed my team. I enjoyed the process, and uh, you know, I, I'm grateful for that opportunity. You know, like we just mentioned, you know, the fight didn't go your way. Volkov is a massive guy. He's just so tall, he uses distance really well. He went to the body a lot. And, you know, you could always take a, a, things away from these fights, win or lose. But, you know, what sorts of things did you take back to the U.S. with you following a fight with a guy like Volkov? Um, you know, just that I, I I'm, can't switch off in the middle of fights. You know, you got to be mentally prepared. And I switched off for a split second in that fight. And, and, it, and it ended up costing me the fight. Um, I went back and I watched it and I was just like, man, it's just that smart. Like, that's the level, you know what I mean? Like top 10 to top five and up, you know, that's just, those guys are so good that you can't switch off. And, um, you know, I, I went back in the gym and I worked cause I mean, we worked on that kick for 13 weeks, bro. Like I was prepared for that kick. I just switched off for that half a second and he capitalized. And so, you know, like that's what I took away from it, man. Just stay focused. The full 15 to 25 minutes, um, or whatever be, you know, however long you're in there. It has been a crazy year for everybody. Walt, you especially in and out of the octagon. We, we don't know when this pandemic is going to end, but you know, you've had some great opportunities along the way. You've had main events, being on the broadcast as an analyst this past weekend, et cetera. Is there a part of you that's like ready to just throw this calendar in the trash and turn to 2021? Oh. Or are you excited for that to oh. happen? Yeah, man. I threw, I started. I, I got rid of it months ago, bro. Like I'm so mentally over 2020. It's just it's ridiculous, bro. It's been the worst year ever for everybody, um, you know. But trying to just you know keep working and staying positive and, and and being here present for my family. But man, this year cannot end fast enough, bro. I'm so glad it's December and you know, um, just glad it's all over, man. For real. Yeah, we made it to December. It seemed like we never get here, right? Right. I just it's crazy that it's December. It was like, man, this can't get here fast enough and now it's here. It's like, man, it's weird, man. This year has been extremely, extremely weird. In a perfect world, when would you like to get back in there and compete? Is there a certain time frame that you have in mind to for twenty twenty one? Yeah, I was thinking February. Um 
I, I you know, I'm a, I need to take some time mentally for myself. You know, I, I kind of feel like um, I jumped back in it so quick after everything. You know, I hadn't had a whole like I really hadn't even grieved properly, to be honest. Um, you know, and then I, I just need to I heard Anthony say something. Uh, you know, he talked to somebody. You know, I think that's going to be key for me as well. I haven't really talked to somebody, you know, I think those things are important. I think mental health is huge. And I've, I've realized that more over this last year than anything or, or at any point in my life, how important mental health is. Um, you know, so I think I'm gonna take a little bit of time, to, you know, the next couple of weeks to focus on that. And then probably February, you know, March, maybe, um, kind of see where I am and then go from there. Have you, do you feel like you've been able to, 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 to grieve appropriately at this point? I mean, you, like you said, you jumped right back into this thing and, you know, you felt like maybe it would take your mind off of everything. And I can't even imagine what, what you've gone through, but you know, have, have you, have, do you feel like you've, you've been able to process that and, and grieve to this point? I mean, in spurts, man, it's weird because like you said, you know, I've been trying to stay busy to take my mind off of it. Um, and, and it's worked to a certain degree, but then there's, there's that day where it hits you and I just break down, you know what I mean? And um, so I think that, no, I haven't fully grieved how I need to. Um, you know, I think I need to sit down and really, really assess, you know, the mental side of it, which I'm about to start working with some sports psychologists. And, you know, I have a therapist. Um, I'm not seeing it as regular as I should, but, you know, that that part of it, I think, is key. For me, you know what I mean? Um, I think I need to really take that into consideration and, and then get back into it. Because like you said, I, I've been trying to stay busy, you know, just to keep my mind, you know, from just going to that super, super dark place. But, um, you know, we'll get all that figured out and, and I'll be back stronger than ever for sure. Because I, I know we, we've spoken in the past bef before all this happened and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you, you we've talked about depression and, and going through different things in your life and, and overcoming mm -hmm. obstacles. And you and you've been a part of that and had to deal with those things as well. Has mm -hmm. those things that you've that you've learned along the way? How much is that? I mean, it's it's hard to say help, but how much has that kind of assisted you in this process? It, it definitely has. You know, I mean, like. This, this is nothing I, I've ever been through or w wish anybody to go through, but I think some of the things that I've been through in my life have kind of helped me hold on to this point, um, if you will. Um, but like I said, this is uncharted territory for myself as well. Um, so it's something that I definitely need to sit down and analyze deeper and, um, you know, just to make sure I'm OK, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, sometimes I think we tend to forget about ourselves because we're trying to take care of others and look out for others. Um, and then being a fighter on top of that doesn't make it any easier because when you're a fighter, you feel like you can get, you can make it through anything. You know, and that's a lot of my problem. I feel like, all right, I'll be all right. You know, you'll figure it out later. And, um, you know, sometimes you need to slow down and, and really look at it and see where you are. Um, to make sure you're okay. So we'll see, man. I mean, I, I'm blessed. I got good people around me. So I think everything will work out. It's hard to, to, to transition from that, but yeah, I know you're a, you're a giant basketball fan. So much movement going on. We just saw the Russell Westbrook bro, trade. <laughs> what do you think of all crazy, this movement? Crazy, bro. <laughs> I'm so excited. The season starts in what, like two weeks. Um, so like, I'm just, you know, super excited about, that you know like it, it's just gonna be fun there's so much movement um i don't think ad signed his contract yet so like he i don't think he's gonna leave but i feel like i feel like he's waiting to see what Giannis does um so i'm excited about that and and just basketball in general man i'm excited to watch it again and i'll be honest like last year i didn't watch as much i probably started watching the bubble midway through um just because basketball just kind of lost its flair man it felt like you know, and I hate to blame LeBron for, but it's just like when he started the super team thing, man. It I'm an old school ball player, so like the Jordan era is what I'm what Me I'm too. accustomed to, man. You don't team up with the rivals, bro. Like that's just dang what we do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it kind of took a lot of the love for basketball away, but now I'm starting to like kind of kind of get it back because the ba the balance in the league seems like it's coming back a little bit. You got you got KD and Kyrie. You got um you got uh. Russell Westbrook and Bradley Bill in Washington. You're going to have John Wall and hopefully Harden. So, you know, everything's kind of evening out, you know, 
even though the Lakers are going to win it again, I feel like, um, you know, it, it'll be fun to watch, man. And I'm excited to see it. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm from the Boston area, so I'm, I'm a big Celtics fan. I feel like there's a lot to be excited about. Like if, if I were to buy stock in the NBA, I would buy a lot of the Celtics because they're so young and they're so talented, but oh, they're just not there yet. They got, it's just, it's, something's not quite there. Like they're missing, I don't know if it's a piece or like, cause Tatum is the real deal, bro. Oh, yeah. Like that dude's legit. And, you know, and, and I'm sold on Jalen Brown as well as a two way player. I, I think he plays on both ends of the floor and he plays hard every night. It's just him consistency. I think it's going to be, his key, but I can't figure out what it is that they're missing. You know what I mean? It, it, like they had so many opportunities to put the heat away and they just, you know, I don't know, but I, I love, I love the, I love the look of the Boston Celtics for sure. They need a big man. They've needed a big man for like five I, years. I, now. I, think that, I think that could be it, but I mean, it, it's so weird with the NBA, you know, like they have the small lineups and like, is is what? Which way are they going? Are they going back to the traditional big man? Are they going to go small? I don't know. So, um, you know, I saw them draft a bunch of bunch of big men, and and I don't know. They may be going back to the traditional four out four round one, and playing that way. So we'll see. But man, it's gonna be fun to watch. I wish we could get Kendrick Perkins back from like a decade ago. <laughs> Just bring him in there, man. Bro, dude, he was, perfect he fit. Was a dog, man. <laughs> he was a dog. Toughest personified. Absolutely, man. Hey, I appreciate the time, Walt. It's great catching up with you again. I, I thought you did a phenomenal job on the broadcast. I hope this is a regular thing for you. And who knows? Maybe this will parlay to seeing you do some sideline reporting for ESPN, doing in, in the bubble sometime or in these arenas full of Dude, people. I'd love to see that. That'd be unbelievable, man. I would love to do that uh, for sure. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network.